I'm so glad that you joined us today for Manifest Live on this amazing occasion where we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, I've heard people already comment that this is a very strange Easter, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, we can't do the big mass Easter egg hunts. We can't even get together with extended family or friends. Things are just weird. But I want to remind you that the first Easter was far more strange. In fact, I would go so far as to say that was the first Easter. That was the, the Easter from Hades. Because, I mean, just pick, put yourself in the disciples' shoes, okay? If you're one of the disciples, you've left a promising career or a family business. Maybe you left your school hanging to follow this Messiah who's cast this beautiful vision for the kingdom of God. You've seen him do miracles and you're thinking, okay, we are on a roll. This is it. It's happening. And then one day, out of the blue, as you're praying in a garden, he seems to be really stressed out. Soldiers come out of the mist, literally, and arrest him with torches. And off he goes into the night. And you're like, what the? And you're trying to figure out what's even happening. You scatter as these, these followers regroup a little bit. And you find out the next morning... He's been taken to a public square to Pilate, the procurator of Rome, who's presiding over Jerusalem, and he's being beaten to death. So you gather there in the square, and there he is, sure enough. He's being tortured, whipped, and you're wincing with every single blow. Maybe you brought a buddy with you, and you're like, watch this. Watch this. Any moment now, he's going to like, whoa, angels are going to come out of the sky, <clears throat> nuke him from orbit, and it doesn't happen. Before you know it, he's taken out of the courtyard, barely standing, already bleeding out, forced to carry his own cross outside the city until they nail him to this piece of wood. And every single time they're abusing him, you're thinking, how is this happening? I mean, this is, this is the guy who is larger than life. This is the guy who cast this vision for a life that would never end. And by the end of the day, he says, it is finished, breathes his last, and dies. What do we do now? What, what am I supposed to think? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to plan on? What can I depend on if I can't depend on him? Many of us probably feel the same way right about now. We thought, man, that job, that's the one I'm going to retire at. That company, oh man, it's huge, it's growing, or that business I started. You know, all these things we thought we could depend on. We hoped they would have been there, and now it doesn't seem so sure. Right? Sometimes in life, it feels like the curtain is starting to fall. The doors are starting to close. The, the, the credits are starting to roll, and we're thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought this was going to last forever. But I want to give you good news, like a punchline before the punchline. Because Easter, more than any other time of year, in any religion on earth, teaches us that it ain't over till it's over. And it's not over till God says it's over. This is how it played out once they laid Jesus in that tomb. Very early Sunday morning, the women made their way down to Jesus' tomb, carrying spices they had prepared. Arriving at the tomb, they discovered that the huge stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside, so they went in to look. But the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. They stood there, stunned and perplexed. Suddenly, two men in dazzling white robes, shining like lightning, appeared above them. Terrified, the women fell to the ground on their faces. The men in white said to them, Why would you look for the living one in a tomb? He is not here, for he has risen. Have you forgotten what he said to you while he was still in Galilee? The Son of Man is destined to be handed over to sinful men to be nailed to a cross, and on the third day he will rise again? All at once, they remembered his boys. 
Leaving the tomb, they went to break the news to the eleven and to all the others of what they had seen and heard. When the disciples heard the testimony of the woman, it made no sense, and they were unable to believe what they heard. But Peter jumped up and ran the entire distance to the tomb to see for himself. Stooping down, he looked inside and discovered it was empty. There was only the linen sheet lying there. Staggered by this, he walked away, wondering what it all meant. Startled and terrified, the disciples were convinced they'd seen a ghost. But standing among them, he said, Be at peace. I am the living God. Don't be afraid. Why would you be so frightened? Don't let doubt or fear into your hearts, for I am. Come and gaze upon my pierced hands and feet. See for yourselves, it is I standing here alive. Touch me and know my wounds are real. See that I have a body of flesh and bone. Later that Sunday, while they were still discussing all of this, Jesus suddenly manifested right in front of their eyes. He showed them his pierced hands and feet and let them touch his wounds. The disciples were ecstatic, yet dumbfounded, unable to fully comprehend it. He supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scriptures. He said to them, Everything that has happened fulfills what was prophesied of me. Christ, the Messiah, was destined to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Now you must go into all the nations and preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins so that they will turn to me. For you are my witnesses, and you've seen for yourselves all that has transpired. And I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise to you. So stay here in the city until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you and wraps around you. That's so good. Reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said about the resurrection of Jesus. He puts it this way. God raised him, that's Jesus, from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He actually was larger than life because death could not hold him. This is what we celebrate. The writer of the Hebrews says that Jesus shared in their humanity, that's our humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Isn't that crazy? I love that. He came to set us free from death and our fear of death, which is really what's at play whenever we're struggling with loss, whenever we're trying desperately to hold on to things that are slipping through our fingers, whenever we're grieving or angry or frustrated that something's been taken to us, what we're struggling with is death. Because how many of you know that death is not just a moment in time, there's a process of dying. We die a thousand little deaths before the big one hits. And every single one of those, feels like we're giving something up. And every time it happens, a little bit of us dies on the inside. And so we are afraid of death. Even if you're not afraid of dying on the ultimate scale, I can guarantee you, part of you is afraid of death. And we hear that Jesus came to set us free from all that. Now, is that even possible though? Is it possible to be free of a fear of death? Not just a fear of death, you know, crossing over the divide, not just a fear of, of what happens to get to that point, not just to, just, but just to be fear of all death in all its forms. The answer is yes. There's a man in the New Testament called the Apostle Paul. He was reflecting on his own prison time and some of his near-death experiences because he had been arrested and tortured and stoned to death and got raised to, to light. It's all crazy stuff. Read the New Testament. Trust me, it's awesome. And this is what he says. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can you get that? He's like, hey, if I'm alive, it's all Jesus, baby. But even if I die, meh, it's an upgrade. I get to go to be with Jesus, which is way better by far. He says in that same passage, I'd much rather go to be with Jesus 
than be here. But I think for your sake, I should probably be here. So I'm guessing God's going to let me stay for a while. That's it. That was his attitude. Now, years ago, I was reading that passage and thinking, man, that is not how I think. That is not my approach to death. I mean, I clutch onto things like I will die if I don't have them. And I'm not living. I, I wouldn't rather go to be with Jesus. I don't think that's better by far. And I realized then there's something wrong with my belief system. Because the Apostle Paul, he was there. He was living that. And I realized that's what I want. About that same time, I was preparing for a funeral. Shauna's grandmother had passed away and they asked me to do the meditation for the funeral. And I felt like God was leading me to focus on what heaven would be like. And so I started to dig into what heaven would be like. And as my eyes opened, I realized, oh my goodness, I actually want to go to heaven more than I want to be here. Now, I'm a good dad, I'm a good husband, but I was actually, at least off and on, and I have been since, with the Apostle Paul on this one, this would be better by far to go and be with Jesus. Now, how many of you would want that? Come on. How many of you want that? If you want that, put that in the comments right below. Just say, I want to be free of my fear of death. Just type that in, even as I'm speaking, and we can get some great conversation going around that. Now, what I want to teach you today is how to defy death. I couldn't think of a better topic than Easter for Easter morning than how to defy death. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that God has led me through over the years to help me learn to be there. And I, I'm not like always there. I'm just going to confess. But when I'm there, it's because these things are true. So I'm going to share these things with you today. All right. Now, the first one, maybe this seems obvious to you if you're a church person. If you're not a church person, this might seem like, well, why would I need to do that? I'll explain. And that is the first thing we need to embrace the power of Jesus' resurrection. We've already talked about it. We've heard the stories this morning. We've talked about how that Jesus did this. He faced death and overcame death so that we could overcome death and not be afraid of death. At one point in Jesus' ministry, he was late for a funeral. I don't know if you've ever been late for a funeral. Not cool. You don't walk in when the cast is coming in. Really bad. You don't come late for weddings either. But a funeral, like you got one shot to get that sucker right. You do not come late for a funeral. Jesus came late for a funeral. And because he was late, he missed his friend's death. So he could have been there to save him. And the, the two sisters, Martha and Mary, sisters to Lazarus, the man who had died, kind of gave it to Jesus. Both of them. They're like, hey, if you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. So uh, thank you very much, right? And then Jesus could see their grief. Now, last week we talked about how God's throne is never shaken by our earthly struggles, but his heart is always moved by them. So here's Jesus watching these sisters in grief. They're frustrated. They're, they're just lashing out for blame, anything. And his heart breaks for them. And we read that Jesus actually wept, not because Lazarus had died, but because these people around him were hurting. But then he turns to Martha, one of the sisters, and he says this. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, that question it still stands. Like, this is the question, okay? Jesus is positing that question to you and I. And until we settle this one, there is no defying death. Until we settle this question, do we believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do we believe that his resurrection was like a first fruits of what's to come that has been offered to us as we put our faith in him? If we believe that, all kinds of other things are off the table. All kinds of other fears we just can't entertain because I've got the resurrection and the life. So this is the question. And it's not complicated. It's yes, no. Well, kind of this and just no. Yes or no. If you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, you just, you just go all in. 
You don't just kind of do it. This is, this is not a kind of thing. Yes or no. If he is the resurrection and the life, again, all kinds of other things flow. If he's not, we've got to circle back around. If you don't think he is, I should say, we've got to circle back around and figure out, do we believe that Jesus rose from the dead and work from there? Because Jesus' resurrection means that he has turned the ultimate defeat into the ultimate victory. I mean, can you imagine the devil? He's like, I'm going to take the son of God down. What do we got? What do we got back there in the shop? Well, we got death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go there. It's not like one of these weapons where he's trying little stuff first. He's like, let's get the nuke out first. So death, boom, hits Jesus with his best shot, right? Death. And what happens three days later, Jesus rises from the grave and Satan's like, okay, anything else we got there? No, we got nothing. There's nothing. There's nowhere to go from there. Like, how do you defeat someone who defeats you by dying? You can't. You can't defeat someone like that when God gives us that victory. We are undefeatable. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at us. Even if we somehow physically die, the promise from Jesus is you will never die. Like our body might die, but you won't die. You will continue forever and ever and ever. It's so awesome. So awesome. Now, what this means is that in Jesus, death is a doorway, not a dead end. There's a, a late uh, philosopher, theologian, that wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy. His name is Dallas Willard. And he writes some stunning things about what he discovered in the New Testament as he studied Jesus and the apostles' approach to death. I'm back. I forgot my book. Now it's story time with Brad. So I'm just going to read it right from the book. Look at all these sticky notes. This is how profound this book is. But Willard says this, he says, once we have grasped our situation in God's full world, the startling disregard Jesus and the New Testament writers have for physical death suddenly makes sense. Paul bluntly states, as we have just seen, that Jesus abolished death, just simply did away with it. Nothing like what is usually understood as death will happen to those who have entered his life. His meaning was that those who love and are loved by God are not allowed to cease to exist because they're God's treasures. He delights in them and he intends to hold on to them. He's even prepared for them an individualized eternal work in his vast universe. I, gotta, I just got to keep reading a little bit more. So as we think of life and make plans for it, we should not be anticipating going through some terrible event called death to be avoided at all costs, even though it can't be avoided. That's the usual attitude for human beings, no doubt, but immersed in Christ in action, we may be sure that our life, that, un that familiar one we're each so well acquainted with, will never stop. We should be anticipating what we will be doing 300 or 1,000 or 10,000 years from now in this marvelous universe. Woo! That is awesome stuff. And that is the first part of the puzzle. If you want to learn to defy death, you need to embrace the power of Jesus' resurrection. So good. The second part is to embrace Jesus' pattern as our process. The Apostle Paul that Willard was talking about there, he says this. He says, if we have been united with him, that's Christ, in a death like his, we will certainly also be un united with him in a resurrection like his. Let me ask you a question. What's the one prerequisite for a resurrection? I'll wait. It's death. Like to be resurrected, you've got to be dead first. So, we need to embrace Jesus' pattern as our process. In other words, if you want to be free of death, you need to die first so that Jesus can resurrect you. Here, here's the deal. If, if you're just trying to hold on to your life and avoid death at all costs, eventually it's going to get you. But if you've already died and been resurrect, re resurrected, what can Satan do to you? What can anyone do to you? 
This is good stuff. So embracing Jesus' pattern as our process. Now, this pattern exists all the way through the New Testament. So this is what Jesus said way before he even died on the cross. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Where is he going? Up the hill to die. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. How many of you understand that to experience the life of Jesus, we have to experience a kind of death. That's a letting go of the things we're trying to hold on to. This is the great paradox of the universe. The more we try to hang on to stuff, the more likely we are to lose it. Jesus actually promises us. He says, I promise you, if you try to hold on to your life, you will lose it. But if you lose it to me, if you give it up to me, you will find it. And once you find it, no one will be able to take it from you. Isn't that awesome? There's another scripture that talks about the power of this principle. Again, the the Apostle Paul, whom we've mentioned, said this. He said, by dying to what bound us, we have been released. Now, he's talking here about the power of the law and the rules of the religious order. But the principle applies across the board. How do you get released? How do you experience deliverance? You die to what binds you. Instead of fighting what binds you, you die to it because then it's dead to you. And then you can be resurrected. And once you've been resurrected, it doesn't have any power over you because you've got a whole different God-powered kind of life. This is the process of Jesus. Jesus uses this example. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it does, it produces many seeds. So let's apply that principle by dying to what binds us. The seed dies, it's planted in the ground like it's buried, right? And then what happens? It breaks out of what's binding it, that, that shell around it, to become exponentially more than it could have ever been remaining in that little bud. And this is what Jesus is trying to do. He says, you're holding on to this life inside of this seed, this shell, and you're holding on to it like it's all there is. But I'm telling you, if you let it die, the, the, the husk around you that's been holding you back will burst open and the real you will expand and you will grow into places and things and qualities you never dreamt possible. He said, I've got so very much for you. Now, the third aspect or the third kind of principle in defying death, after we've embraced the power of his resurrection, we've embraced his path or his pattern as our process. There's a lot of peas. Come on, I'm a preacher. I got this. This third one is to embrace his promise as your prize. His promise as your prize. I mentioned earlier that I had been preparing for this funeral and uh, for Shauna's grandmother. And and as I looked into the scriptures, really what I was focusing on was heaven in particular, saw the promises and the beauty and the glory and the, 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 angels and the throne and the sea of glass and the, the beauty of this, this paradise that God has for us with him is the crowning, you know, reward for everything that's ever happened in earth, on earth. I just, I was just blown away. It totally won me over as I focused on the promise of God that would be my prize. And as, as I focused on it, I, I realized it. In other words, it became real to me, realized. And as it became real to me, I just went, oh my goodness, this, this is far better than anything I could experience here on earth. So good. So what am I talking about when I talk about that promise? Well, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though, we're, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles, and that's what they are are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Don't grapple with this. Don't go, yeah, but like either it's true or it's not. If it's true, 
all kinds of doubts, all kinds of voices, all kinds of fears are off the table. They're no longer valid because this is the truth. This is the truth. So awesome. Now, I have a confession to make. I'm a, I'm a movie buff, buff, buff. I'm a buff, I'm not buff, I'm just it's a movie buff. Just gonna rewind that, maybe edit that out. Anyways, I actually love the ending of action movies because it's where the bad guys get theirs. You know what I'm talking about? Like the, the irredeemably bad villains who, who just screw everybody over and they, they kill people and they steal, kill and destroy. And at the end, you just know this whole thing going to come back and this poetic irony and he's going to get it bad. And part of me goes, yes, inside. I'm just going to confess that to you right now. I know I'm a pastor, but that's just how it is. And wouldn't you know, in the Bible, we find out that the bad guys get theirs in the end and it is glorious. So here's a couple of verses that talk about that. For example, the Apostle Paul says, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So Jesus' victory is going to eat death for breakfast. I just hope I can watch Right? And then there's this moment that happens in the book of Revelation. John, one of the early disciples of Jesus, had this revelation of, of heaven. He was transported into the heavenly courts and he got to see from the perspective of eternity where everything is present. He got to see how the devil gets his, how, how this plays out in the end. And this is what he wrote. But before I get into that, I got to change shirts. <laughs> now, this will make sense in a second, okay? So, this is, what, this is what John saw. The devil was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, and then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. See, this is the thing. This is a shirt that my son Noah made for me, and, and by the way, the proper pronunciation is not boom sucker. You gotta go boom, sucker! Like this is, you gotta get the whole, you gotta come underneath it like that. So here's the deal is I'm gonna ask God if I can wear this shirt on that day. Because I wanna go right to the edge and right when the devil's being thrown over into the abyss, into this, into this lake of fire and death dies for the, <laughs> tell me that won't be an awesome thing to watch. I wanna wear this shirt and I wanna say it. I wanna say the words at the end of time. I just wanna go boom, sucker, because this is the ultimate victory. Even death dies. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing this? Jesus is king. He's alive. We can live in a defiance of death, even though physically we die, even though we lose things, even though things are taken and stolen, even though things are unsure. I can live in the victory of Jesus as I embrace the power of his resurrection. I embrace his pattern as my process. I go through the dying process because how many of you know death is one thing, dying is a whole nother thing. But all of that, I can be free of my fear of death. <sighs> I can embrace his promise as my prize. If you've never put your faith in Jesus before, would you please comment below? Would you do this? There are people there that can help you. Just say, help me. I want to give my life to Jesus and they can guide you into that. But I just want to pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your death, but thank you for your resurrection, that you didn't stay dead, that it's not over till it's over. Thank you that we can live in a defiance of death, that we can embrace the power of your resurrection, that we can embrace your path as our process. Thank you that we can also embrace your promise as our prize and that death has no authority over us. In Jesus' name, amen.